All right, uh, welcome back to the online calls inference seminar. Today, we're uh, excited to have Richard Samroth, who will talk about optimal non-parametric testing of missing completely at random and its connection to uh, compatibility. If you have any questions, please submit them via Q&A. Uh, we have Tom Barrett, a collaborator, uh, answer questions there. Um, after the talk, we'll have a discussion by Yixin Wang from the University uh, of Michigan. Um, Ying today will handle questions, so I'll quickly hand over to her. Thank you, Dominic. So as usual, please use the Q&A uh, to submit your question. So it is a button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, so please do submit the questions through the Q&A for us to better track the questions. And also we encourage you to submit the questions immediately as you have them. And uh, I think Richard will um, answer them at some pauses or at the end of the talk. So that's all. Without further ado, please feel free to take over, Richard. Okay, thank you very much, Ing and Dominic, for, for the kind introduction. Uh, so I'm going to give a talk about uh, missing data, which is maybe not so directly uh, related to, to uh, causal inference, but not so uh, not a million miles away either. Um, so this, everything I'll speak about is joint work with uh, Tom Barrett, who is online and is was my PhD student and postdoc, and is now an assistant professor at the University of Warwick. So. Um, why should we care about missing data these days? We have so much data around, why, why does it matter if some of it's missing? Um, after all, Fisher didn't seem to think it was important. Uh, he said that the best solution to have handle missing data is to have none. Um, well, that's one attitude, of course. We would all like to right. have no missing data. Richard, we don't see your slides right now. You don't see my slides. Yeah, just Thank uh, you very much for um, <laughs> interrupting me. That's embarrassing. Okay, now you should be able to see everything. So what, what, what you missed was the, the nice picture of Tom. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so, so the quote from Fisher is that the best solution to handle missing data is to have none. Um, and unfortunately, that's uh, not always realistic. Um, and I actually want to argue that these days, um, missing data can be even more important in the big data era than it ever used to be. And I want to do this via a very simple toy example. Um, let's imagine that you have a data matrix, an N by D data matrix, where every entry is observed independently and with a high probability, 99%. So let's think of each row of this matrix as corresponding to an individual in, in a study, for instance. Um, in a, in a 20th century situation where we, uh, where we had five, five variables measured on each individual, uh, then life's not too bad if you try just ignore the rows uh, where you've got any missingness because you get to keep about 95% of your observations. Um, but even by the time you get up to 300 uh, covariates, which is by no means extreme by today's standards, then things are a disaster. You only get to keep about 5% uh, of your observations. So you really have to decide what you're going to do with, with your missing data now. And in fact, in, in the applied work that, that I do as part of the statistics clinic, primarily in Cambridge, um, I would say that missing data is one of the most common gaps uh, that I see between uh, the sort of stylized uh, models we like to postulate for the way that data were generated and how the data that actually appear on, on our uh, computer uh, actually look. And, and somehow, you, I mean, you can think of this as a form of misspecification in that sense, but it's even worse than that because you can't even run an algorithm until you've decided what you're gonna do about the missing data. Um, so this is a very serious problem. We need to, to uh, decide what to do about it. Um, but uh, here was a cartoon that I found uh, somewhat amusing. Uh, that explains the different ways in which uh, data might be missing. Uh, so we have a situation where we're interested, for instance, in an average homework score ac across a class, uh, but there's a risk that a dog might eat your homework. Um, so the ideal situation would be where the probability that a dog eats uh, your homework is, is, is independent of uh, all other relevant um, attributes. Uh, that's missing completely at random uh, situation. 
another sort of intermediate setting is, is uh, missing at random situation, which won't be the focus of this talk. But for instance, if it were the case that uh, a dog was more, e more likely to eat a, do a boy's homework than a girl's homework, uh, this might be a situation uh, where this would apply. Uh, life still wouldn't be too bad. You could perhaps estimate the average score for boys and girls separately. The situation that's really damaging for you uh, is where dogs eat, the dog eats bad homework. Right? Uh, then uh, you're going to find it very difficult to try to estimate an average homework score. OK, so really the, the simplest setting uh, is that of missing completely at random. So that is where the uh, data generating mechanism and the missingness mechanism are, are independent. Um, that's uh, an ideal situation and it makes the, the analysis uh, much easier and more interpretable and is meant, for instance, that in recent years there's been a lot of work done on various problems, particularly in high dimensional statistics, uh, where there may be missingness um, under the missing completely random hypothesis. So these include works on uh, high dimensional regression, uh, on classification and sparse PCA, uh, on change point problems uh, and, and high dimensional PCA, uh, non-sparse versions of, of PCA. So um, all, all of these, I think, are, are very interesting work. I think particularly it's interesting where uh, the, the, the missingness may be heterogeneous across different variables and you would like to understand what's the what's the right interaction between the signal strength and the uh, missingness the, the heterogeneous missingness probabilities that determines uh, the difficulty of the problem okay so the setting I want to think about in this work where we're going to be thinking about testing the missing complete random hypothesis is where I have a data vector taking values in a product space that I'll call curly X um, but I don't necessarily get to observe all, all, all of that data vector. And I have a revelation vector that I'll call omega. That's a binary vector. Each component's a binary uh, variable. Uh, so it's a d-dimensional binary vector. Uh, and what we get to see is this vector, which I write as this x circ omega, um, whose jth component is equal to the jth component of the, of the data vector if the revelation vector has corresponding component equal to one and it's a star which means that a missing entry if the corresponding component of the revelation vector is zero so the, the first problem I, I want to think about is where we get to observe n independent copies of the random vector x circ omega and we want to test the missing complete yet random null hypothesis that is the null hypothesis that x is independent of, of omega so this is um, an independence test, but it's a non-standard independence test because I don't get to see all of the replicates of, of X that I'd like to be able to see. Let me write uh, blackboard bold S for the set of possible observation patterns. So that is uh, the, the set of uh, vector, of, of binary vectors uh, for which I have a positive probability of observing. And I'll write PS for the conditional distribution of the, the subvector of X, XS, uh, conditional on that being what I observe. So conditional on omega being the indicator function of S. And I collect together those conditional distributions uh, as P blackboard bold S. <coughs> so um, various tests have been proposed for this hypothesis in the past. Uh, one of the most well-known is due to Rod Little from 1988. And uh, this really is a little paper in a certain sense. It's a five-page paper, uh, but it's got more than 8,000 citations. So this is a wi widely cited and used uh, method. Um, it's, it's designed for Gaussian data where all pairs of variables are observed together. Okay. And in that case, you can use the EM algorithm to find the MLEs for the population mean and covariance matrix. And then what you're going to do is you're going to compare the observed mean within each observation pattern with the fitted mean uh, from, the, uh, from the EM algorithm. And you're going to construct this, this sort of chi-squared type of statistic here. And one thing you can see from the form of this, uh, this sort of quadratic form style of this, this test statistic 
is that if the difference uh, between in, in the distributions across the different observation patterns is not reflected in a difference in mean, then this test statistic is going to be powerless to detect it. OK. Another viable test is, is Fuchs's test uh, from a few years earlier, from 1982. This is designed for a setting where uh, my space, my sample space is discrete and where I get to see complete cases. That means the full set one up to, to D is a possible observation pattern, has positive probability of being observed. And again, you can use an EM algorithm to find the MLE for the population distribution. And you can construct a sort of generalized likelihood ratio style statistic uh, that you can compare with a, with a chi-squared uh, uh, quantile. So the, the first element of this sum uh, is coming from the complete cases. And then the, 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 uh, the second term is, is from uh, the other cases. Another related but slightly different test is, is one of consistency. So if you give me two possible uh, observation patterns that have non-trivial overlap, I can think about taking the, the distributions PS1 and PS2 and marginalizing them onto the overlapping set S1 intersect in S2. And I'll say that the family of distributions is consistent if whenever I marginalize in this way, whether I marginalize S1 onto the overlap or marginalize S2 onto the overlap, I always get the same distribution. So you can imagine in this picture that we've got five bivariate distributions, uh, P12, P23, P3, P4, P45, and P15. And if we look at P12 and P23, when we marginalize onto the second coordinate on the variable two, uh, these agree, and P23 and P34 agree on, on the, uh, the third variable. But what you can see uh, depicted here is that when I marginalize P12 and P15 onto the first variable, they don't agree. And if that's the case, then this family is not consistent. Um, and I can rule out uh, the, the null hypothesis of MCAR being true. So this motivates you to consider two sample tests of consistency. That, that is, you just uh, do pairwise tests of equality of, of these different uh, distributions. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, testing consistency is not sufficient for testing MC, the MCAR hypothesis in the sense that I can find non-MCAR settings where all consistency tests have trivial power. And here is one such case. So here we have three bivariate normal distributions. Uh, so P12, P23, and P13. And you'll notice that uh, th these are certainly consistent because the univariate marginals in all cases are just a standard normal ran random vectors, random variables. Um, but X2 and X3 are highly positively correlated X1 and X3 are highly positively correlated. And then it's not going to be possible for X1 and X2 to be highly negatively correlated in, in, a, in an MCAR setting. I'll, I'll say more about the reason for that later on. But to come back to our overall goals, what we'd like to do is we'd like to introduce a way of testing the MCAR hypothesis that doesn't rely on parametric assumptions that can be used for any possible set of observation patterns without the need for complete cases or for data on each pair of variables, and which has power against all detectable alternatives. So what do I mean by a detectable alternative? Uh, well, here's uh, a very simple, but, but I, I think quite an instructive example. Imagine a situation where you've got a standard normal random variable, but you only get to observe it if it's non-negative. So this is certainly not an MCAR setting uh, because actually omega is a function of X here. But I could also imagine another situation where I have a, a random variable X prime that's got a folded normal distribution, that is the absolute value of a standard normal random variable, and where I just get to observe it with probability a half independently of, of X prime, okay? And what you can see is that <laughs> that the data I would observe would be identically distributed in, in both cases. So 
but 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 uh, the first setting, the x and the omega, is certainly not MCAR, whereas x prime and omega prime are MCAR. So I can rule out. I I, I can't rule out um, MCAR being true or false in this case. And the key to understanding uh, what are detectable alternatives is the notion of compatibility. So I'll say that the family of distributions is compatible. I'll say it belongs to this set curly PS0. If I can find a joint distribution on the whole product space whose marginal distribution on the sub product space curly XS is PS for each S. Um, so in the in our the simplest non-trivial example, uh, and one that I'll come back to quite frequently, of three bivariate marginal distributions, where I've got P12, a P13, and a P23, the question is, does there exist a trivariate distribution uh, who, whose three bivariate marginals are given by, by those distributions? Okay. If so, I say that the family is compatible. So to get your intuition sorted, if my, that my set of possible observation patterns is just a set of singletons, uh, then any family of distributions is compatible because the product distribution of those univariate marginals is, is going to be uh, um, is going to satisfy the requirements. Um, if I can observe complete cases, if if the set one up to D belongs to blackboard bold S, then compatibility is equivalent to consistency. Um, but in the case of the three bivariate marginal distributions, uh, P12, P23, and P13, then consistency is not sufficient for compatibility. And so if I go back to this e example we had here, we can now see why this, uh, this family couldn't be compatible because if it were compatible, we would know what the trivariate covariance matrix would, would have to be. It would be ones on the diagonal. It would be um, minus rho in the one, two entry, rho in the one, three entry, rho in the two, three entry, and it would be symmetric, okay? But that couldn't be the covariance matrix because that matrix has got a negative eigenvalue when, when rho is bigger than a half. And that's how I can rule out the uh, MCAR setting in, in uh, uh, in that case. So let's come back to what is the connection between MCAR and compatibility. If the null hypothesis holds, that means I can find I've got my uh, vector x and my vector omega and they're independent, then the marginal distribution of the subvector xs, is, its distribution is unchanged by conditioning on omega because xs and omega are independent. And we called that distribution PS. And what that means is that the distribution of X is, is compatible because XS has the distribution PS for each S. Conversely, if the family is compatible, what that means is that there exists a joint distribution on the product space such that if I draw a random vector X tilde having that joint distribution independently of my, my data X and omega, then x tilde circ omega is going to have the same distribution as x circ omega. In other words, this distribution of, of x tilde and omega satisfies uh, the MCL hypothesis. So I can't rule out h0. And so we end up with this picture here. We want to test the, the, this, this small null in the middle of, of MCAR, but we've got these undetectable alternatives in, in the red set uh, the set of compatible distributions. So if, uh, if the null H0 holds, then we're compatible. And if we're compatible, then we can't rule out the null of MCR. So the, the best we can hope to do is to try to test the compatibility of the family. And one really important question that we want to tackle first of all uh, is to ask, well, are there any other undetectable alternatives? So could there be incompatible uh, families PS for which it's still impossible to have non-trivial power uh, for, for, a, for a test? I hope this is clear. Maybe I'll pause and see if there are any questions at this point. Hi, Richard. Uh, so far, we don't have live questions, um, but we encourage all the people to submit questions as long as you have them. Okay, in that case, I'll keep going. Thank you.
Um, okay, so to answer this question, I want to make a very small tweak to our model. Um, so we, we previously we observed n independent copies of x circ omega. Now that, that gives you random sample sizes for each observation pattern. But now I want to fix the sample sizes within each observation pattern. So we fix a set of possible observation patterns. And then uh, we have sample sizes ns uh, indexed by uh, the, each uh, set in my set of observation patterns. And I have data sets of size ns within each uh, observation pattern. And all my data are, are independent. So it, it's, it's very similar to the, the setting that we had before, but just with deterministic sample sizes now. And what we're going to try and do is to test compatibility. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, actually, uh, so tests of compatibility are, are, are needed in areas beyond missing data. So in the area of quantum contextuality, for instance, uh, measurements of quantum observables cannot simply be thought of as revealing pre-existing values. In fact, any attempt to do so uh, will, will get, lead to values that depend on, on, uh, on other things that you're observing simultaneously. This is one of the sort of well-known features of, of quantum mechanics. Uh, so you can end up with a situation where things look locally consistent, but are not globally consistent. And this is where this, this phenomenon of, of contextuality arises. So this is sort of illustrated by this famous Escher print, uh, where you have water that's look it looks like it's flowing downhill in the sense that the uh, the, the the wall is going downwards as you as you flow along here, but then the water flows down with hill again and you get back to the beginning. So this is a sort of famously uh, counterintuitive um, uh, picture for, for, from Escher that's sort of reminiscent of the, these uh, these five nodes in, in our graph that we had before. So for instance, Samson Abramsky at University of Oxford has done a lot of work on, on, uh, on contextuality in, in different contexts. The key to understanding compatibility uh, is, is a characterization due to Kellerer from nearly 40 years ago now. Um, he was interested in uh, sort of uh, problems related to optimal transport, um, and, and somehow th this this was how he came up with this characterization, which is related to duality theory in, in linear programming. Uh, so uh, I need to introduce some notation. I'll, I'll write curly G uh, S for a set of sequences of functions. Each each function F S uh, takes uh, has domain curly X S and takes values at least minus one, it's got to be bounded up as semi-continuous. Um, then the set of what I call feasible functions is a set curly GS plus, uh, which is a set of functions in GS that satisfy uh, a, a series of linear constraints. Um, and the Keller characterization says that my family of distributions, which is now a family of marginal distributions because I've got uh, fixed deterministic sample sizes, is compatible if and only if uh, this series of inequalities ho holds uh, one for each feasible function. So um, actually this arises, or you can think of it as a generalization of Farkas's lemma, which, uh, which underpins the theory of, of linear programming. <laughs> um, our contribution uh, our first contribution to this work is to uh, take this characterization of compatibility and turn it into a quantitative measure of incompatibility. In fact, we're going to define an incompatibility index. Uh, we write as R of PS. It's the supremum over all feasible functions uh, of this functional R of PS FS. And then this R of PS FS is very similar to uh, what we saw on the previous slide in terms of this characterization. We've just pre-multiplied by this minus one over the cardinality of blackboard bold S. And the reason we do that is because we're certainly allowed to take uh, a sequence of zero functions as a feasible function. And so that would give us uh, a zero for, for R of PS FS. And so the supremum must be at least zero. That means that R of PS is non-negative. And then Keller's characterization tells us that we're compatible 
uh, that R of PS is zero, that in other words, the incompatibility index is zero, if and only if we're, we're compatible, okay? So uh, that's an attractive uh, property. And moreover, the scaling uh, means that R of PS is less than or equal to one. So we have an index that's telling us how incompatible we are, where zero corresponds to being compatible, okay? This is going to measure in some sense the difficulty of the testing problem. Um, another very nice feature of this incompatibility index is that it has a dual formula. Uh, there are lots of sort of words from topology, uh, which I don't want to focus on too much, but it allows, for instance, each of the spaces to be a Euclidean space. Um, and this theorem says that we can, uh, we can evaluate this incompatibility index by attempting to write my sequence of distributions as a mixture of a compatible sequence and a, an arbitrary sequence of distributions. So you want to put as much mass as you can in the mixture on the compatible sequence, and what you're forced to have left over, uh, that's equal to the incompatibility index. So that's another way of writing this incompatibility index. So when your underlying space is discrete, we can say that the incompatibility index is less than one if and only if there is some element of my sample space that's got positive probability uh, for whenever I marginalize it uh, appropriately. Okay, now I want to come on to statistics and I want to think about trying to test uh, the, the compatibility hypothesis for a discrete uh, sample space. So if I write uh, curly XS for this doubly indexed set, then I can identify the set curly GS of functions uh, with just the space minus one infinity to the curly XS. And then the set of feasible functions I can identify with a convex polyhedral subset. So when I'm trying to compute uh, R of PS, that means I have to compute a supremum of these linear functionals. Um, and I'm computing a supremum of linear functions over a convex polyhedral set. So that's fortunately something that we can do very efficiently using linear programming techniques. And this is also going to tell us how we're going to construct our test statistic. Basically, you just have to construct the, uh, the set of empirical distributions, one for each possible observation pattern, and then you compute the incompatibility index corresponding to that sequence of uh, empirical distributions. That gives you a test statistic that we'll call R hat. Um, of course, then you have to decide how large should R hat be in order for me to reject the null. And uh, the critical value that we're proposing is, is, is C alpha here, which is a moderately complicated formula, um, but you know everything you need to know. Alpha is your desired type one error level, uh, NS are your sample sizes, uh, and curly XS is, is the, uh, the, the alphabet size within the S uh, observation pattern. So the proposition says that if you give me a desired type one and type two error level, then if my sequence is compatible, then the probability that I reject the null, in other words, that my test statistic exceeds the critical value, is less than or equal to alpha. So this is giving a finite sample, uniform type one error control over the set of compatible sequences. Moreover, if you give me any family for which the incompatibility index is sufficiently large, and by sufficiently large, I mean at least C alpha plus C beta, then I have control, again, in a finite sample uniform way over the type 2 error probability. Uh, in fact, the type 2 error probability is no more than beta. Okay. And the good news is that if I think of my sample sizes diverging to infinity, so I get more and more data, then this quantity C alpha tends to zero. And so what that tells me is now when, if, if you ever give me a sequence uh, of distributions for which the incompatibility index is strictly positive, then, <laughs> then given a sufficiently large sample size, I will be able to detect it. So I can remove the question mark in, the, in this previous plot. Uh, we've resolved that question. 
Okay, the next part uh, for the next sort of five or six slides or so, I want to think about how we might be able to improve the test uh, that I've just proposed. Actually, if you look into the proofs of the type one error control um, and the type two error control, you'll see that there's actually a somewhat naive bound that we apply where we bound a supremum over all feasible functions by simply ignoring the, the uh, linear constraints and just using the boundedness constraints that we have. Um, and so our main technique for trying to improve or, or reduce the critical value is to understand the geometry of uh, try to understand the geometry of this feasible set of uh, functions or the or the convex polyhedral set a bit better uh, in order to try to get a tighter bound on on, on how we can uh, choose our critical value. So um, this you can think of trying to to test uh, whether you're compatible or not. It, one, one thing that's interesting about the, the problem is that the set of compatible sequences is actually a full dimensional subset of the set of consistent sequences. And actually the set of consistent se sequences already sort of captures the difficulty of the alternative. And I'll, uh, I'll make that precise uh, in a sense later on. So, um, I mean, we, we used to kind of hypothesis testing problems in parametric statistics where our uh, our parameter space, our null hypothesis parameter space, is a lower dimensional subset of the full space. If we use something like Pearson's chi-square test, for instance, then we're used to having a difference in the dimension. But here, the, the, the null is a full dimensional subset of the relevant sequence of alternatives. And it's known in different but related problems that when you're trying to test uh, whether test membership of a, of a convex polyhedron, you, it depends on the on the specific geometry of the problem, in particular, uh, how close you are to, for instance, a pointed corner of the null. OK, so um, the purpose of this slide is to argue that actually we can compute the incompatibility index, not just as a supremum over all feasible functions, but actually as a maximum over a finite number of functions where we can quantify how many functions uh, we need in, in, in some cases. So uh, in, in, in the kind of full generality, uh, the number of functions that we need is given by the number of what we call essential facets of a certain uh, convex polyhedral set. The, the, what that convex polyhedral set is, is, is perhaps not so immediately important. Um, we, we divide the set of facets into the ones that define non-negativity conditions. We call those non-essential facets for our purposes, uh, and the rest of them are, are what we call essential facets. So if we can understand the geometry well enough uh, to, to, to understand what F is, then we have the potential, uh, as we'll see, to, to uh, get improved tests. Indeed, if, if this, this number at capital F is known, then we can choose a critical value uh, of this form here. Again, somewhat complicated, but, but not too bad. And then we, we have type one and type two error control, much as we had uh, in, in for, for our simple universal test. Again, if we're compatible, uh, then we have finite sample type one error control uh, in the sense that the property we reject the nulls at most alpha. Uh, and if we're sufficiently incompatible, by which we mean uh, uh, the incompatibility index is at least as large, then we have finite sample control of the type two error. And because we know that uh, both of these bounds hold, that means we can take the minimum of the two critical values as actually the one that we're going to use. And that's going to, that's the improvement uh, that we've got from understanding the geometry of the problem. So to go back to uh, what, what in some ways is a simple example, because it only involves D is three and three bivariate mar marginals, uh, but it's actually still already quite complicated. Uh, we, we have this discrete setting where, where the first variable takes values from one up to R, the second from one up to S, and the third is a binary variable. Then for any consistent sequence, we can actually get an exact expression for the incompatibility index. And that ex expression involves a maximum over two to the R plus uh, two to the times two to the S uh, different uh, sets here. So in other words, because actually we can ignore the empty set and we can ignore the full set, 
we can take this number of essential facets to be two to the R minus two times two to the S minus two. That seems, seems like a lot, but actually fortunately, it only appears under a logarithm in this critical value, which is somehow what saves us. But to illustrate the difference between the universal test and the, the sort of improved test, uh, in, for the universal test, is C alpha plus C beta in this example, uh, it goes to zero with the sample size at rate n to the minus a half, but the dependence on R and S is suboptimal because it depends on this product of R times S. Uh, whereas for the improved test, we reduce this to the sum of R and S. So that's the improvement that we get from understanding the geometry of the problem better. Okay, so um, uh, to, to, to obtain this formula, this exact formula for the incompatibility index, uh, we get a lower bound and an upper bound which which agree and the lower bound you get by uh, thinking about the primal problem that is for each uh, subset a of one up to r each subset b of one up to s you have to find a, a good feasible sequence that, that uh, gives you a large value of r of ps for that sequence of functions uh, for the upper bound you actually work with the dual problem uh, and we ended up relating the uh, incompatibility index to the maximum of a two commodity flow. Uh, so I wanted to show this picture because it took me a long time to, to draw it in text. Um, so the, the idea is that you, uh, you can have this expression for the incompatibility index, which comes from the dual formula. And uh, you can think about, you've got sources S1 and S2, uh, and, and how much flow can you push through this network uh, and get re to reach these sinks at T1 and T2, where the capacity of each of these links is given by, uh, is coming from the constraints in, in this formula. Uh, and by solving that two commodity flow problem, that's how you can, can get the, the upper bound. Uh, somehow, if there were only one com commodity, you could use the max flow min cut theorem, uh, but there's no general max flow min cut theorem for two commodity flows, and that's why you have to uh, work from scratch. Okay, let's think about this problem in a minimax testing framework. Um, if we want to have uniform power against classes of alternatives, we're going to need to keep ourselves away from the boundary of the uh, null hypothesis parameter space. So we'll introduce this family curly PS rho, where the incompatibility index is at least rho. And then we can think about the maximum, the minimum, sorry, the minimax risk at separation rho in this problem, by which we mean you take a test uh, psi, and psi just means, uh, so you take the, the, uh, your data and you have to return a value in the interval from zero to one, where one means you reject and zero means you don't reject. So uh, we, we, we take the, that set of measurable functions, we think about the worst case type one error, that is we take the supremum over all compatible sequences of the type one error, and then this quantity here is the type two error probability. And we take the worst case of that over all uh, sequences for which the uh, incompatibility index is at least rho. So I'm keeping myself away from the boundary. And having done that, I try to minimize this sum of the type one and type two errors over all possible tests. Uh, the minimax testing radius, which is a key quantity we want to think about, is going to be the critical level of rho that allows me to have non-trivial power in this problem. It allows the, uh, the minimax risk at separation rho to be less than or equal to half. So the picture to have in mind here is just that this rho gives you a bit of elbow room to keep you away from, from the boundary. Okay, so we go back to our, our three bivariate uh, uh, marginal example. And what we actually proved before um, is an upper bound on the, the minimax testing radius of this form here. Uh, so again, we get the sort of parametric rate in the sample sizes, and we get the, the, uh, this de these dependencies on R and S. And so what we can now argue using our minimax lower bound, a corresponding minimax lower bound, is uh, that, we're, that this test, this improved test, um, is minimax optimal up to a logarithmic factor because the minimax lower bound uh, matches the upper bound apart from these log of R plus S and the log R and the log S in the denominators here. 
So this is a sense in which our test of compatibility is, is, is optimal. It's optimal up to polylogarithmic factors, at least in this example. And I want to now try to argue that, that actually uh, it's optimal in rather more generality than this. Uh, one thing that's interesting to note and comes back to something I mentioned earlier is that the sequence of distributions in the lower bound construction belongs to the set of consistent sequences. So that's why that's really already capturing uh, the sufficient difficulty uh, of the overall problem. So if we want to go beyond D equals three, which we certainly would like to be able to do in practice, um, well, it, it can be quite difficult to obtain analytic expressions for R of PS uh, in many cases that, that we can go a bit beyond D equals three, but fortunately we can reduce a lot of complicated uh, problems down to simpler problems. So here's a setting where for instance, so we've got uh, three possible observation patterns, we've got five variables, uh, but you'll notice that variable four only appears in one element of, of the set of observation patterns, as does five. And what we can show is that the incompatibility index is, then just reduces to what we what you'd get if you ignored variables four and five. Here's another situation where there's a subset of variables that appears in all of the uh, observation patterns. And then you, in the, at least in the discrete case, you can get this exact formula for the incompatibility index by conditioning on the variables that you always observe. Uh, so here's an example uh, with four variables uh, where we can reduce the situation using this formula and compute an expression for the incompatibility index, uh, similar to what we had in the three-dimensional case. And lastly, there are situations uh, where, for instance, you can almost separate uh, your set of observation patterns uh, into two, and there's just one uh, element in common uh, given by the one three uh, in, in, in this example. And then you can bound the incompatibility index between the sum and, and, and the maximum. So I, I realize I've gone through these quickly, but the point is that uh, these reductions allow you to reduce many more complicated situations to simpler ones. For instance, if you think about all possible uh, D equals four examples, so all possible uh, observation patterns with four variables, you can actually reduce these down to five irreducible ones. And for each of these patterns, we can compute the incompatibility index and we know how, how many non how many essential facets uh, there, there are. So we know that what, what F is for our improved test. Richard, sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Just wanted to remind you of the time. It would be great if you would could wrap up in five minutes. Or so. Five minutes, I think I should be fine. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so everything I've said as far as statistics goes so far was for uh, discrete data, but we can also deal with continuous data uh, in the natural way by binning it. I don't mean by throwing it away. I mean by, by quantizing it appropriately. And if you have appropriate smoothness for, for the underlying continuous components, then you can get um, uh, corresponding upper bounds on the minimax testing radius, um, similar to what you, you'd be familiar with from other non-parametric statistics problems. Okay, I should say something about uh, empirical results. Uh, actually, it turns out that for empirical results, we found it most convenient to use a kind of Monte Carlo test uh, because the original tests, even though they have these finite sample type one and type two error control uh, results, those bound can be a bit conservative in practice. So um, we, we came up with this idea of a Monte Carlo test where, um, you, so when you compute the incompatibility index uh, and a sequence of empirical distributions, you get this representation from the dual formula uh, of, of of a mixture of a compatible sequence and an, uh, a general sequence. And this sequence Q hat S, you can think of as being like the closest compatible sequence to the original. So whenever you're doing uh, a, a composite, testing a composite null, um, you need to, to decide which element of the null you're going to draw your, your um, Monte Carlo samples from. Uh, and here it makes most sense to draw them from the closest compatible sequence. So we generate our bootstrap distributions. We just do a usual Monte Carlo test uh, from there. The theory for this test uh, is similar to what we had before, 
except you just need to keep yourself a little bit away from the boundary, keep yourself within the interior of the null. Uh, so that's what this, this P0S minus epsilon is just keeping you distance epsilon from the boundary. And then uh, the, 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 the proposition says that similar to before, if you're, if you're sort of within this interior of the null, uh, then you control the type one error. Uh, and if you draw enough Monte Carlo samples and you're sufficiently incompatible, then again, you have finite sample type two error control. So here's a comparison of our uh, test with, with Fuchs's test uh, in our three bivariate marginals distribution. The trouble with trying to apply Fuchs's test in this example is that there are no complete cases. So what we did was we allowed Fuchs's test to cheat. We gave it 200 additional complete cases. We got 200 observations from each of these missingness patterns. And we've chosen these, these uh, probabilities to allow us to, to, to go from uh, the compatible case to essentially a fully incompatible case where, where both tests have, have full power. And our test is in black and the Fuchs's test is in red. And you'll see that in this example, Fuchs's test is, is rather conservative uh, and our test has more power, even though Fuchs's test uh, had access to these uh, additional complete cases. Um, here's again a, a D equals five example uh, where we're in black and Fuchs's test has different levels of complete cases. Uh, and in this case, we're actually the only test that controls the type one error at the desired level. Uh, and Fuchs's test doesn't, but, but our power is still competitive for different levels of complete cases. So to wrap up then, uh, testing the MCAR hypothesis is equivalent to testing compatibility. That's I think one of the main takeaway messages uh, from this work. We propose a very general universal test that's got asymptotic power one against fixed alternatives uh, for discrete data or, or data that you can uh, bin. Uh, from continuous components. Uh, you can improve these tests if you have knowledge of the underlying geometry, and then you can show that these tests are rate optimal in certain cases. Uh, and a Monte Carlo version of the, uh, of the critical value uh, gives uh, very good empirical power in practical examples. Uh, so if you're interested in reading further, the paper is available in the archive, and we have an R package called MCAR test for which uh, you, where you can try out this test in practice. I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the very nice talk. Just like maybe one quick question that I had. So if you have like a, essentially like a, a high dimensional like scenario where like have you you have lots of like variables and then also lots of like marginals, hmm. do you, can you scale to that or like would you first do some pre-screening to like reduce it to something simpler? You, you certainly would want to apply these reductions as much as you can but before you started. Actually, it turns out that um, the most time-consuming part of the because you know, linear programming is, is so efficient these, these days that the most time consuming part of this um, of, of the algorithm is actually loading this this matrix A of, of constraints into uh, into memory. Uh, and, and so this is uh, a very, very sparse matrix. It's just got uh, the cardinality of blackboard bold S ones in each in each column. Um, and I suspect that. Um, so, so we, we we're, we're not exploiting that sparsity at the moment, okay. um, but I suspect that if you looked at linear programming solvers that did exploit the sparsity, uh, you could probably get things working much faster. I mean, even even so, I mean, I don't know what you'd call large dimension, uh, but I think we've we've uh, we've dealt with D is forty in examples in in, in uh, special cases. So. Um, moderate uh, dimensional cases, I think. That's great, thanks. I think in the interest of time, we should move on to the discussion. Uh, Yishin, uh, when, whenever you're ready. Oh, sure. Yes, let me share a screen. Cool. So yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to discuss. It's a very exciting paper. Um, 
I think I'll, I'll broadly just focus on um, I think I, I'm, I work more on the applied side and see a lot of the uh, applied causal problems really involve the understanding of the compatibility of distributions. So um, from the talk, we see that the paper really offers a very interesting measure of incompatibility of uh, distributions we observe in terms of how we, uh, whether there exists a joint that's compatible with all the different marginals we observe and how do we uh, perform and design optimal non-parameter te non tests. So, um, I mean, the, the broadly the setup uh, that could be relevant in the applied problems I'm thinking of, uh, let's say we'll start with, we're given a set of marginals and we're interested in understanding the compatible set, uh, which is a set of joint distributions that may be compatible with all the marginals we observe. And in this work, um, it's able to provide very interesting tests and optimal non parametric tests to test whether this compatible set is empty. Uh, it provides incompatibility index, which is measure, it's a measure of incompatibility. Uh, of this of the set of marginals. A related question is many causal inference problems, uh, at least in the application I work with, involve consideration of just understanding the structure of compatible set. Uh, and I guess a broader question I would like to uh, discuss is can all of this uh, characterization and incompat incompatibility index in the compatible set be extended to understanding all of these uh, uh, causal problems. So I'm going to try to give three examples of the applications uh, that I work with, and um, hopefully they'll get us understand whether uh, all the developments, exciting developments in the M MCAR will also be able to benefit all the other causal problems that we care about. So um, I'm going to briefly mention three problems. Um, one is partial identification. Uh, the other is the causal marginal problem and its identifiability, which is something in causal machine learning we think a lot about. Um, and finally, in applied settings, especially in biology, we work, we think a lot about, in computational biology, we think a lot about combinatorial generalizations of interventions and whether this understanding compatib compatible set can help us uh, perform experimental design. So uh, on the partial identification part, um, and this is how the thinking of compatible set uh, may be relevant. So if we take a constrained optimization view of partial identification, like um, say, suppose I'm interested in perform partial identification of average human effect where my covariates uh, or confounders are noisy or have missing observations, then we can easily frame this partial identification problem into a constrained optimization problem where a constraint is basically the con compatible set. Uh, to be more concrete, suppose I'm working under the ignorability conditions and say I, uh, my average human effect can be identified as a functional of some joint of uh, some treatment outcome and some ground truth covariates, which I may not be able to observe, but may only be observed, be able to observe a measurement with measurement error or with some missing data. Then we can immediately frame the partial identification problem into uh, an optimization where we find among all the joint of treatment outcome and ground truth covariates that are compatible with my observations, what is the minimum average human effect and what is the maximum average human effect. And these two quantities will immediately give us the partial identification interval. Um, so intuitively, we'll think that the larger the compatible set is, then the wider uh, the interval is and, um, and also the uh, vice versa. So as the first question of, um, of our understanding of incompatible, incompatibility index, which characterized the other side of like how, how all of these marginal observations are incompatible with each other, um, may be able to translate to uh, understanding the width of partial identification interval for particular functional of the fun uh, of the joint distribution we may be interested in. So this is first example where we, I mean, even though I gave like a noisy covariate or missing covariate setup, but broadly a lot of the partial identification problems can be framed this way. And broadly the uh, thinking about incompat incompatibility and compatible set could really benefit um, 
us from understanding the landscape of partial identification. The second example um, practical problem uh, where this compatibility thinking can be relevant is the so-called causal marginal problem, um, which we think a lot about in causal machine learning, in particular thinking about compositionality. Where basically um, there's a setting where we observe parts of causal models and we ask, can, we, can these marginal causal models be consistently merged? And what constraints on marginal and joint causal models does this merging um, imply? Um, of course, more classically, there is a version of statistics marginal problem where we we're just given distributions over non-identical but overlapping subset of variables, and we determine the existence and uniqueness of a consistent joint distribution. So with a little bit, a little bit of more causal structure, um, we're really interested in how we merge causal models. So here are two examples of this causal marginal problem where on the left-hand side, um, we have three, the the full system has three variables, but we only observe two variables at a time, and each of them has a causal structure. So given the observations of two marginal observations of pairs of random variables in a causal system, can we use these characterizations? Can we understand what is compatible set of causal models and joint distributions um, of this causal system? And can characterization of compatible set really suggest plausible hypothesis that's that could be testable or detectable about this joint. Um, I mean, more realistically, in, in practical settings, we also work with more complicated setups where we have multiple random variables and we observe different subsets of potentially overlapping subsets of variables about this causal system uh, at a time. And the understanding compatible set could be really useful if it could help us suggest plausible hypothesis um, people may try to test about the joint. Like people want to understand, given a common question scientists would really like to ask is given all these different views of the system, what can we know about the system? Like, I don't even know what the right question to ask. So they understand the compatible set can suggest hypothesis to test. I guess the final uh, final example I give where compatible, uh, the understanding compatible set may be really relevant is in combinatorial generalization. So in biology experiments, especially in genomics, we're a lot of times interested in how singleton interventions can combinatorially generalize to combinations of combinations of singleton uh, interventions. So I may want to. Uh, it's easier and cheaper to perform individual uh, interventions. I can intervene on gene A and gene B. I'm interested in how interventions on the combinations of gene A and B will have an effect on the outcome. Um, I mean, in a slide, I'll say how this is this is akin to generalize from measurements with missing data to uh, without missing data. And broadly, the understanding of incompatibility and compatibility compatible set could really be useful if it can help us design experiments. Like biologists are really interested in, I'm interested uh, asking what experiments I should perform so that I can achieve the best power of combinatorial generalization uh, to, to a set of interventions I'm interested in. So to, to be more concrete, how is it related to missing data? Um, we can consider this genomics problem where suppose I have D genes in the system and all my observations are going to be D dimensional for each gene I have a measurement. So the specific structure and how missing data is relevant is if I observe D uh, gene expressions, we commonly assume they come from a Gaussian distribution whose precision matrix respect to the causal structure among the D genes. So the precision matrix is going to um, reflect the unknown causal structure among the genes, which I, we may not have observations or uh, measurements for. However, we can collect data under interventions on one or more genes. And what intervention will mean in this context is the resulting observations we get will have a precision matrix whose rows and columns that correspond to the gene we that gets intervened will get zeroed out. So that's, we get observations observations um, that come from a precision matrix whose certain rows and columns get zeroed out. And the eventual interesting question for biologists is we are interested in understanding what this full precision matrix will look like. So again, this is a question about we observe parts of the matrix, though here this is, this is not uh, missing data 
on the observation, but rather we're missing entries on the precision matrix we're interested in. And we want to recover the full precision matrix. I wonder if the understanding of compatible set and incompatibility characterization could really help us understand what genes we should intervene on or how should we collect our data so that the data is maximally informative of the full precision matrix, which is um, the behavior of the whole gene, gene system. Um, and this will be really powerful. I mean, really help science. This is precisely the question we're re really interested in. Um, if this characterization of compatible set uh, could be broadened, um, could work with this kind of applications. Um, so yeah, I guess these are all the related applications that really um, reminds me of when I see this compatibility work and really excited to see, uh, be interested in understanding whether this exciting development can be extended to these practical setups that we really care about. Thanks for the nice discussion, Yushin. Uh, Richard, do you want to quickly respond? Uh, uh, to put well, I don't think I'm going to be able to give uh, immediate answers to, to uh, all these great questions, but I think they are, uh, they are fascinating questions. Uh, in terms of the, um, the geometry you were asking about, I, I think um, we, we can understand the, this set of compatible sequences as a convex polyhedral subset uh, within this, this Euclidean space in, in a discrete case. I think that gives us all that does give us a handle on on kind of what it looks like, uh, what, what what things look like. Uh, we can use our geometric intuition from Euclidean spaces to to uh, to help us in 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 those cases. Um, but I think there are a lot of um, a lot of great questions here. I, I think um, I I see missing data is for the reason I mentioned right at the beginning that I think it's it's such an important problem that crops up uh, all the time in practice I, I see this as um, a big growth area at the, at the moment um, partly because I, I think it's um, it, it's kind of interesting to to look at this from a non-parametric perspective and and uh, introduce these kind of new ideas in, into into the field. So I'll be excited to see where, where this goes. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. I think in the interest uh, of time, we should we should uh, close now. Yeah. First, thank you so much, Richard, for like a very nice talk and you, Shin, for, uh, <clears throat> for a very interesting discussion. Um, also, uh, thank you, um, uh, Tom, for like uh, helping out in Q&A. I just quickly want to announce who we have next time. Uh, so next time we're going to have Benedict Colnet from INRIA, who will talk about risk ratio, odds ratio, risk difference, which causal measure is easier to generalize, and strategy-proof decision-making in panel data settings. So next time will be two talks, uh, two student talks. We're looking forward to it. Thank you all for coming. Hope you have a great week uh, and see you next time. <laughs>